yo después. Sí, no, 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 Hello everyone. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much for uh, staying. Um, we know that uh, you have options. It's a weekend, um, even though the weather is kind of challenging. We're still in Austin, so thank you for uh, staying. Uh, we are going to have our um, next panel, which is a really uh, uh, fascinating thought-provoking panel on uh, sex work, uh, migration, and trafficking. So we are going to have uh, three speakers. Um, the first one is, uh, and I'm going to introduce each one of them uh, before they give uh, their individual presentations. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Agustin, who is a lifetime borderless uh, migrant and a naked anthropologist uh, who has been doing uh, research and advocate, advocacy on undocumented migration, sex war, trafficking, and uh, for more than uh, 20 years. And the title of her presentation is uh, Denial of Consent. Uh, I changed the title of my uh, presentation and in fact, I threw away the presentation I was going to do and am doing something different because the other two people on this panel are addressing trafficking. And since that's what I've devoted my life to, I found that it was impossible not to talk about migration as the framework. Um, so the full title would be Denial of Consent to Adult Women and Adolescents Who Sell Sex so that I was very struck from the beginning by European, I, I've lived in Europe for many years, by European pushing kind of the idea of consent, but consent is what's being denied very large number of people in this trafficking narrative. Um, I should, I'd just like to lo locate myself at the beginning that 20 years ago, or more than 20 years ago, I was not an academic. I uh, thought that I was a feminist, but I was a person wandering around the world, and I had odd jobs. And I was in the Caribbean and in <clears throat> South America uh, working in NGOs in AIDS prevention. At this time, this is the early 90s, the word trafficking was not used. But migration, undocumented migration, was talked about a lot. And the moment that was crystallizing for me was when I was in the Dominican Republic, which is the island next to Cuba, um, in 1994, when it became obvious to me that people, middle class people from the United States, Canada, and Europe were coming down to places where large numbers of women and men migrate out of because of a lack of jobs and telling them <clears throat> that they shouldn't do it, that they didn't understand that selling sex was a terrible thing, that they, were, they had false consciousness. There was an in, entire story that was being 
told to people as though poor black people couldn't possibly know their own mind. And I was struck and appalled by that. And in the end, I went, uh, I ended up going back to school uh, as a, you know, a person with advanced age um, to try to figure out what the problem was about this. So it was before the word trafficking was used. Uh, there's a major migration of Dominican women to Europe <clears throat> and to other places where the two options for a woman were to be a maid inside someone's house or to sell sex. And these options were discussed by people who were going to pay other people to get them to their destination <coughs> illegally. So this is undocumented migration, but it is completely normal, widespread. These are travel agents who simply are not regulated. And they tended also to be friends and families doing this fixing of voyages and jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, th th so they were not big organized gangs, and they were not enormous stories about particularly fiendish men who, would, uh, who were preying on people. Um, women have been more than 50% of migrants for almost 50 years now. So this is not new. This is very old. Women as protagonists of migration um, have been extremely important for a long time as people with agency. Um, I ended up, I did a master's degree. I, I continued to be appalled by the infantilization of grown women and adolescent people by middle class people in the United States and Europe who beginning to call them all victims. Um, the result of the work that I did and the thesis that I wrote for the Open University in the UK is a book called Sex at the Margins, which was published by Zed Books. And the full title of it is Sex at the Margins, Migration, Labor Markets, and the Rescue Industry because that's what I studied. I didn't study poor women trying to get ahead desperately. No, I understood those women. I understood the teenagers who were doing it. I sympathized with them. They were my friends. But I did not understand the imposition by people saying they were helping to wipe out the voices of these people and to tell them that they, as middle class social workers or whatever, knew best what was good for them and that they should stay home or they shouldn't sell sex, whatever it was. So the rescue industry is a phrase that I created for the title of the book and which will probably be on my gravestone because it's the most important thing, it seems, that I created because it spoke to a lot of people. I never would have known, but they all began to write to me. Now. Um, during the time, at the beginning, I thought that when uh, the word trafficking began to come up, and I thought, oh, well, they must be talking about some people that I don't know anything about, because the, it's not the people I'm talking about. And after a few years, I realized, indeed, they're talking about the migrants that have decided in a situation with not very many nice options, they have decided to take a risk, have an adventure, go abroad, do what their friends and sisters did, and some of them preferred to become a maid living in very medieval feudal circumstances inside houses, and some decided to try selling sex. And it's very much a personal question of what you could imagine that you could do, and how much money you wanted to make because you make 10 times more if you sell sex. And if you're a maid, it will take you a very, very long time to pay off your debt. Um, so these are people who, this is not the lowest of the low people in desperate circumstances. No, that's impossible. You can, don't have the social networks to make a migration if you're completely without any hope at all. These are people using social networks, hearing stories. It's perfectly possible, even in the late 90s, for very poor people to go to cyber cafes and look up stuff about the weather in Switzerland and try to decide if they wanted to go 
there or Paris or, or whatever. So this is a really fascinating topic and I can talk for hours about it and I won't. But that was what I was doing. I was thinking about that and as I was doing it and doing this immense amount of reading, I, um, the trafficking word began to resonate in a really big way and I realized, well, I, there's no way I can't talk about that. Um, the problem about this word is that to this day it is not properly agreed on universally what it means. So we have a situation like with pornography. And by the way, like with prostitution, these are vague terms that are not understood. However, in the year 2000, the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime was issued, and it had two protocols attached to it. So there's a problem for me right away because this is organized crime. It was put, in, these migration protocols were put inside a crime framework which is not how most people think about what they're doing when they migrate. They do not believe that they're doing anything criminal. Um, so the two protocols, the Palermo protocols from 2000, one was on smuggling and one was on trafficking. And from my point of view, they're a disaster because they're completely gendered. So the trafficking protocol names sex as a form of exploitation and mentions women and children. And just the way Cynthia Enloe dec decades ago talked about the strange construction of women and children as a single word, you saw it come back. And that's what we have now. Um, the idea, so this is again infantilization. Everyone, all the adult women can, are not deciding, the adolescents are not deciding, they're all being constructed as children, the smuggling protocol, protocol is clearly talking about men who pay someone to get them across a border. It's illegal, yes, <laughs> it's illegal. However, they are granted some agency. The assumption is that the man can do this and can overcome the obstacles that will happen along the way if there's bad luck, which there's not always bad luck, but sometimes people have bad luck, whereas the assumption for the women and the girls is that if something bad happens to you, you will be damaged for life. You have to be called a victim, you have to be taken care of, middle class people have to come and embrace you and, and fix your life for you and you will never get over this. This was extremely offensive <laughs> To me, I might be, I don't know if I'm the oldest woman in the room, but I remember the early 60s, the late 50s, when ideas about women being assertive and stepping up and taking responsibility were what we heard, that the domestication wasn't good. So from my point of view, this trafficking thing has been a huge step backwards for women. Um, so. It began to be, at this point I was still writing, it began to be impossible to separate anti-trafficking movements from anti-prostitution <laughs> movements. Now, <clears throat> in the United States, prostitution is a crime. Buying sex and selling sex are both crimes. In Europe and the rest of the world, in most countries, that's not the case. And I had thought that I would be talking about different kinds of prostitution law models, and if anyone wants to know about that later, they can come and ask me. Um, so in the United States, you get this increasing fusion of anti-prostitution with anti-trafficking. In Europe, you're getting a lot of confusion because there's, there are movements amongst the kind of feminists that, or with the kind of feminist ideas that Bill Thompson was talking about, that prostitution is, by definition, violence against women, and therefore there can never be any consent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So very early on in my career, I realized, okay, well, there's this feminist thing going on, and that'll go on forever, but I don't, I, this is not interesting. This is a, like a religious question. If you think that selling sex 
sounds like the most disgusting, debasing thing in the world, then that's how you feel. And I have talked to thousands of people who feel that way, and it takes on a religious kind of feeling, that sex is something that should only happen in a certain kind of family or love, romantic kind of way. And it turns out that there are just as many people who don't feel that way, who feel that they can love some people they have sex with and some people they don't have to love them and they can even take money from them and it's not a difficulty. And it would be very easy to just skip all this ridiculous conflict about what prostitution is by saying, well, we have diversity here. It's just like everyone not liking chocolate or anything else. Um, in the United States, it's pretty much the, this is the place where all, everything horrible comes from in the trafficking world because uh, George W. Bush put a huge amount of money into a trafficking person's office and an act and there, it's enormous amounts of money which means that lots of NGOs pick this up without understanding what they're doing. Um, the, the confusion here in this country is that since prostitution is still a crime, women are being called victims, but they are arrested. So you see pictures of victims in handcuffs repeatedly, who are then taken to police stations and coerced into promising to leave prostitution in order to avoid jail. Um, it is co coercion. Uh, the, the one school of feminism that has had a big role in this is the one that insists on a concept called violence against women. And violence against women, when it came up as a concept in the 1980s, was a fabulous, liberating thing that asked us to see that men beating their wives up was not normal and did not have to be accepted. It was wonderful, I bet you remember. It was a really, it was a lovely thing. But the idea of violence has been increased to cover so many things at this point that it's almost meaningless. And other people in other presentations uh, alluded to this at least. So, uh, but ideological conflicts about what prostitution means are unfortunately having a huge effect, even in places like Germany where sex is regulated, there are state-run brothels, there are sex worker organizations there. <laughs> even there, you've got people come, some Alice Schwarzer has been going around saying, you know, there's maybe a few happy hookers, but 95% of <clears throat> all these women are uh, victims and don't know their own minds. Um, You've got language changes so that the old vice squads are now being called counter-exploitation units. Um, redefinition has been a huge part of this. So that um, smuggling, what should be called smuggling is now called trafficking. Any kind of migrant agency, where well, they're now called victims or trafficked people. Uh, anyone who sells sex, whether they call themselves a sex worker or an escort or whatever, they're all reframed as victims so that you read these endless newspaper stories that are very confusing and you get a complete obliteration of diversity. And any idea that women are consenting is completely denied. This is now obliterated so that while all these other groups that I've been listening to, the idea is that we have to understand the concept of consent. And we heard that the idea of calling, every, talk, calling teenagers children is ridiculous. However, Helmut didn't say that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child from the late 90s defines everyone under 18 as a child. And this is used by the anti-prostitution people and the anti-trafficking people to apparently say that everyone's a child. These are, all, these are all people that cannot consent. 
and the presence of the money is supposed to make it some completely different thing from any other kind of sex, which as an anthropologist, I can tell you there is no way to understand that except as a fetish, that there's some kind of fetish about money. Um, you will also note that in these anti-trafficking and rescue industry narratives, nobody cares about men. It doesn't matter that men are prostitutes or sex workers or rent boys or gigolos. It doesn't matter. They're not considered victims by definition. If they're men who are under 18, then they'll get included in the children's thing. But really, the rescue efforts, the bashing down doors of brothels in Cambodia and in these places is about women constructed as poor, uneducated, <laughs> third world ladies, brown and black people who can't possibly decide anything. This is tremendously colonialist. This is extremely offensive. And I never stop mm -hmm. screaming about it. Um, at the bottom of all this is an idea about prostitution, which is another vague word. There is no one definition. If we took the time and asked, it would turn out that we'd be it would take weeks to try to decide. So do you think that someone who does phone sex is doing prostitution? What about webcam girls? There's no physical contact. Someone might be having an orgasm. Strippers, peep shows, independent escorts, escorts who have chosen to work with agencies who organize their time for them, people in organized brothels, whether they have penetrative sex or not. There are people who do nothing but hand jobs all day in, a, in some massage parlors. Is that, do you, is that prostitution? No one will agree about that. Of course, when uh, newspaper editors uh, run these stories, they always take the same shot of the women in high boots leaning into cars on the street. But that is, in fact, the dwindling, tiny number all over the world. This is not where most of it's happening now. For those of us who study the sex industry, the internet is the new street. That's obvious. You would all, I'm sure, know that. Then you have all kinds of teenage things, people, kids who pick people up at malls. The telephone is the center of everything. And then you have large numbers of hostesses and bar girls. And they don't all have sex the same way. Individuals decide what they're wanting to do. Um, this applies to men, women, transgender people, <clears throat> all sex orientations, people who work part-time, occasionally, or full-time, people who do this in order to pay to go to university, to get the degree that they think is going to get them a wonderful job now. Um, so I've talked to thousands of these people for 20 years, all over the world. Um, there's no difference in what poorer people without huge education or blacker people or browner people say to what whiter people say. There's a huge pro-rights movement in which activists in all <coughs> countries try to stand up and advocate for consent and agencies. And guess what? One of the biggest groups of them is in India among the Dalits. So this is the lowest class you've got. They've got a union with 60,000 women and transgender and men in saris asking for rights. So this is actually something that where people in Dalits in India and kids in Mexico will, can actually meet and agree. Although the actual venues they sell sex in might be different, they, uh, they immediately understand what the issues are. I should also say that I have talked to many people who hated it. They were appalled. They didn't understand what it was going to be like. They, they wanted to get out. They had a terrible time. But they all said, don't call me a victim. Something bad happened to me. And I'm getting over it, and I'm going to go on and have an ordinary life. So, but in the victimology, which is a whole kind of discipline that came up during all this, that came to we should have victim-centered, not crime and criminal-centered, uh, uh, a discipline to put the victim first, that came up. And again, it sounds very good. but. 
It requires the, the temporary identity that you get if someone commits a crime on you. Uh, there's a perpetrator and a, a victim and a police person that comes in. Um, it tends to, it has led to a victim identity that people are getting stuck with forever, uh, again, and with psychological kind of uh, ideas going on. Um, the, the idea that most of the arguments that happen in this field as though we all have to agree. Either it is all awful and, and they are all victims and it's all violence or everybody's happy. No one is talking about happiness. This, this idea, Xaviera Hollander in the 1970s called her book The Happy Hooker. This does not mean that everyone's going around talking about being happy. There's a huge long continuum for selling sex in which there are two fantasy figures. At one end is this happy hooker who loves everything and has no, no problems at all. And at the other is this enslaved girl who is in chains, locked in a basement someplace. They're, both of these are complete fantasies. Everybody else is in the middle in this gray zone in which some of what they do, they knew about beforehand and wanted to do, and some of it turned out to be pretty crappy. People try to, most people, thank God, even amongst all the undocumented workers, never have any problems. They get over it. They get to Spain, and they get one of these jobs, and if they don't like it, they leave it and go to another one. Do they have debts? Yes. This is also, I reject the idea of debt bondage. They got debts because they're buying services in order to travel. And to call it debt bondage as though it's a demonic thing is quite misleading. We don't talk about students in debt bondage, although students actually say, I feel that I'm in bondage forever now. Or people who buy houses with enormous mortgages. There are other kinds of debts that are not seen to be so upsetting. Uh, so the general tendency that I saw as time was going on was that, uh, that the people that I came to call the rescue industry were beginning to say, oh, well, <clears throat> these are voiceless people, so we have to give voice to the voiceless. This is tremendously colonialist, maternalistic behavior because all these people, in fact, have voices. The issue is that no one wants to listen to what they have to say. Um, and even people who get in trouble, mostly adapt, escape. Clients help people to escape. They stick with it for a while, and then they get out of it. Um, of the main problem, if you're talking about migrants, is that if you have ended up in any country and undocumented, then you basically have no rights, except whatever we think that human rights are, but it never applies to migrants. So that, so that if the police actually did free you from a brothel in downtown Austin and found out you were un undocumented, you'd be deported. So there's not the, it's not good to be rescued if you're going to be deported. So most people avoid Anyone who looks like an authority figure, anyone who says that, oh, I'll help you escape because juridically you have no right to be in the country you're in. And I know that a lot of uh, rescue industry people have said that we're not talking about migrants anymore, but excuse me, we are because it's either mobility and even within this country people run away, teenagers who left home because it was hell at home and wanted to go somewhere else do not want to be rescued and forcibly pushed back to a home life that made them so miserable they left. So again, the consent of the individual, the description of the individual of what they wanted is completely dismissed. Um, there's a lot of technicalities in Europe, which a lot of countries in the European Union are in the Schengen Agreement, which means that you are allowed to cross into other countries to work, however, a lot of the legislation in countries that, um, that regulate sex work exclude migrants on the excuse now that they might be trafficked, even when they, even when they say they're not. Um, you have feminists insisting that everyone is trafficked. Uh, I have a website 
which I invite you all to come uh, look at, and I'm very active on Facebook and Twitter. I am the Naked Anthropologist, and I regularly publish media reports and problematizations of these incredible stories that obliterate all of these women's consent. Um, so you just Google my name, you'll get it. It's the Naked Anthropologist. Um, I should say that the worst thing that we see now is really incompetent uh, journalism. I can't even call it journalism anymore, it's so bad. The, the, the figures that are thrown out are all fantasies. You have to understand that you cannot have real statistics in this field. If selling sex is illegal, workers are not registered anywhere to do it. If migrants are undocumented, by definition, they weren't recorded at the border. So we have no idea how many of anybody there is, and all of these, um, all of the numbers that are thrown out, and there's a lot of people debunking these now. There was an incredible example this past week and yesterday here in Texas. So there's a couple of Texas a congressmen and a senator in Washington who claimed in a, about a bill that they were going to make that there are 300,000 sex trafficked cases in the United States. This is, there's no source for that. That is a lie. It is someone made it up. And a few days later, that was in the Houston Chronicle. Yesterday in the Dallas News, an op-ed editorial was published in which the writer said, 300,000 sex trafficking cases are prosecuted in Houston alone. <laughs> no editor looked at that. No one used their common sense. No one said, that's a sixth of the population of Houston. <laughs> so that's impossible. This goes on constantly with people, and the FBI have published absolute rubbish over and over on their website. You have people repeating it all the time. Um, there's no possibility of having real numbers. Now, the moral crusades are, moral crusades are a really big, huge, you know, a huge topic. In this particular field, it's quite clear how Christian fundamentalism works, but it was also clear how feminist fundamentalism works. That is, when I say feminist fundamentalism, the kind that insists that they know better what prostitution is than you yourself if you sell sex, um, and who re reduce everything to a single thing. You might think that this is an amusing topic. The problem is that millions of women and adolescents are victimized and have all agency taken away from them in this process. So they're not being listened to, they're not apparently able to tell their own stories. You have people coming in and speaking for them, and in a country like this one, they're arrested in vast numbers, detained, deported or coerced into claiming victimhood in order to avoid jail and go into some exit program. Um, there are now hundreds of ethnographic uh, studies that confirm that when people, even people who are unhappy at the job that they got and the way their trip worked out, do not wish to be rescued. Rescue is not what they want. They might like a little help getting into a different job or avoiding a particularly disgusting person, but they do not want to be rescued by Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times accompanying and live tweeting violent brothel raids in which doors are bashed in and everyone is scared to death. These are outrageous kind of cowboy moves that are made. Very few slaves and true victims are ever found, especially given the numbers that are claimed. When you follow up at all, and there are people who follow this stuff up, you find that 
Okay, they spent 5,000, they spent 200,000 pounds in Great Britain on Operation Pentameter over a year, and they, in the end they had four victims. So they did all of these brothel raids, they did all of this stuff, they couldn't actually find any, but the people don't denounce their traffickers, they want to be left alone. Um, the rescue industry uses kind of um, a lot of disqualification. So I've been writing about disqualification, that you can't listen to what the women say because they've been psychologically damaged, they're brainwashed, um, they have false consciousness from the feminists, uh, they're too uneducated and primitive. Um, so you drown out, you drown out with all these reasons, the subject's own voices, you deny the consent, and any critique of this from a sex worker or anyone else is, well, you're the exception. You're the exception. Most of them are really pathetic and terrible. You're the privileged one, which again, so you're disqualified. It's the major mechanism to confirm that the rescue industry is necessary, that there are some people who know best how everyone else should live when the subject of commercial sex comes up. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Dr. Noel Bush Armendariz, uh, who is a professor uh, of uh, social work, and she is also the associate dean of uh, research and um, I used another title. Research. Oh, sorry, okay. Associate dean of research and the director of the Center for Social uh, Work uh, Research. And she's also the founder and the PI of the UT Austin Institute on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Well, thank you for having me, and I hope I can be as eloquent uh, as Laura. And um, I'm going to offer you a, a different uh, framework, um, actually, for for looking at trafficking. Having spent 20 years in the field, I started actually uh, as a social worker working with incarcerated, battered women who had killed their abusers and actually wanted to be called victims and did want help. Um, and we sought to um, a relief of having a court system, a criminal justice system, un help them understand a history of violence which contributed to their crime uh, in South Carolina at the time. Um, I was brought to this work based on that experience um, and so I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking with you um, I hope to add to a thoughtful conversation about what we know um, and to sort of go back to what the US can learn um, from Europe I'm certainly hoping that will be the case that we can learn from what others are doing but I can only tell you what I know from what we're doing here so that's gonna be my perspective today and hoping to open the dialogue. Um, I uh, have done work, um, although not primarily um, in the sex industry, and want to point you to an editorial. I'm the editor-in-chief of a journal called Affilia, the Journal of Women and Social Work. And in the November issue, we have a very provocative um, editorial um, by a couple of scholars uh, on a project called Project Rose, which is um, a project that is compelling um, sex workers into services, mandated services. And uh, what may be even more disturbing than that perspective is that it is housed in the School of Social Work at Arizona State University and directed by a social worker. And so the editorial is about unpacking the idea that social workers not only should not, um, should be call, calling the question to compelled services, but also shouldn't be working in concert with law enforcement to be compelling people into services. Now we might be on the other end after people are mandated into services and then trying to make systems change, but we certainly shouldn't be on the fore end of that. Um, and so we're, uh, that editorial sort of breaks that down. 
Um, and we've had a very lively discussion now with Arizona State University. and We'll have a uh, rejoiner um, in the coming um, publication from the director who's very angry about us taking that issue on. Um, so um, in, in any case, I'm going to give you some information just to give you some information and then maybe some opinion about uh, the work that we're doing here in the U.S. Um, so a note about language, and I think that Laura has talked about this, survivors or victims. Um, I come from, uh, I cut my teeth in the domestic violence field and we, language is important and it changes um, and grows. Um, I have had uh, women that I have worked, I have primarily worked with women, although I have also worked with uh, men um, and transgendered uh, people. Um, and I have people tell me not to call them survivors either. So it's difficult ha how to speak about people. So maybe individuals is the way to just call people or by their first name. Um, but I, as a social worker, and I know social workers have bad raps, we have a whole body of literature that says so social workers doing very bad things to people, um, sort of m well meaning, but doing very bad things. Um, so we are trying to change that all the time. Um, but, but I'm believing in that people have agency and should have agency. Um, so I start with that premise. Um, and um, by definition, um, know that the framework in the U.S. anyway, and just in giving you information around trafficking, is that it is about exploitation. That is the very heart or premise of it, which is maybe a little bit different perspective than we, what you just heard. Um, okay, so here are um, the key terms to the TVPA, which was passed in 2000, as you also heard, and it's got these three elements. And for it to be trafficking, which is what it, how it does differ than from prostitution, I don't think actually that we confuse the issue of prostitution with trafficking um, because it is about forced fraud or coercion. And it, at the very core of it is about compelled service. That is how it differs. So to me, they're very distinct uh, ideas. I um, have had discussions with um, uh, also around the sex industry um, in, in talking about the sex industry, met with uh, the lawyers of strip clubs in the US um, some time back as we were looking at the impact of the strip club industry, both in Texas and the US. Um, and I, I don't, didn't, have not written about commentary about whether that's good for women or bad for women. I was talking about how they have made the uh, lion's share of the money. Um, if we really wanna talk about uh, who makes the money in the strip club, club industry. Um, but to me, that's really the difference. It's about forced fraud or coercion in the U.S. That's how we frame it in the U.S. and that is how it is different than um, prostitution and that's how we understand it differently. Um, I'm gonna, I agreed to do a little bit of a shorter talk so I'm gonna run through some of these. So we also do talk about two different types of uh, human trafficking in the U.S. Uh, labor and sex trafficking and actually contrary to the previous speaker um, in my dialogue there's a lot of talk about labor trafficking and it is not gendered although I will give you some statistics that show you how it is gendered um, that paying attention to the pain and suffering of anybody is important regardless of gender. Mm -hmm. I actually have these slides if people are interested in them in a handout I don't know. Gloria, if you want to hand those out or not. These are the cases that we've seen um, in the U.S. where people have been trafficked and we have um, prosecuted uh, traffickers in uh, cases that involve these particular uh, industries. Um, and so the reason I bring this up for people who don't know about trafficking, not necessarily this group, but people who don't know about it is because they might not realize that they are interacting with people who may be forced, being forced, coerced, or frauded into 
um, a compelled service. Um, so it is not necessarily um, what people think of um, as uh, what the hype of uh, the media shows us, but it may be in restaurants, you know, that you and I um, go into and, and uh, eat dinners at. Um, what we do know is it's not about transportation, so you don't have to cross borders, you don't have to cross state lines. Um, it, it is about these other things. So force fraud or coercion examples. Um, and so let me back up also just for a second and say part of uh, how I've learned about trafficking is through um, my own research. Um, we've been doing research for about seven years uh, here in Texas. Um, we um, have interviewed victims. We've also interviewed those people that are working directly in, um, on the front lines uh, in this field. Um, so that's part of how I come to it, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. So um, people often want to know what force fraud or coercion looks like. Um, and this is different when, again, juxtaposition the discussion of migration. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but when people come, uh, they have false promises about legitimate work. Um, and so they think they're going to come and do one job, and they get here and they're actually doing another job. Um, some trafficking does actually involve physical abuse, um, although we see that uh, more infrequently than the media would believe us um, that it doesn't occur all that often. Um, fraud and coercion happen more often. Um, this is what we see um, happen more often in victims, and certainly this has uh, come true in terms of my um, interviews with victims, and so it's really interesting. I was listening to Laura thinking, we're talking to the same people and we're hearing very different stories, or at least coming to different conclusions. Um, in terms, the conclusions uh, may be different, although um, the I, premise of agency for me is, is not different. I do believe that people have their own agency, can make their own choices about uh, next steps for their own lives, so that, that is not different. But I do hear people talk about being coerced. Um, I do hear women when they are, um, we had a case in Houston, and I've interviewed these women over six years, um, sort of watching um, how they're doing um, post-extraction um, from that trafficking situation. Um, and one of the reasons that they were kept there, because they were not chained um, to the cantina, and I'm going to show you that case in just a minute, um, is because the threats to their children um, were so profound um, that the traffickers could get a hold of their children in their home country and made threats which they thought were credible threats uh, to those children and it kept them um, coerced into continuing to be trafficked. Um, their own words, not my words, right? So again, that's a juxtaposition as Laura's heard that uh, maybe same story. Their own words that they stayed there because they felt like they didn't have a choice. Um, um, again, differences in um, trafficking and smuggling. Um, coming across uh, the border, um, you heard, with no coercion, although what we do know is that in the United States that smuggling can involve, uh, can turn into trafficking and often does turn into trafficking and we see that in Texas actually um, more often, I think, um, and are alerted to it more often in Texas uh, maybe than in other places. Uh, these are the numbers and I'm a researcher. I'm a, a, a mixed method researcher. I'm a qualitative researcher. Um, I'm also a quantitative researcher, and so um, I actually don't believe um, the hyperbole that, that was stated that um, all statistics lie. Um, what, 
there are some very refined ways in which we get some numbers. I think most of the rhetoric that's in the literature now about the statistics is that um, we don't know. These are our best guesses about the numbers. The best guesses are based on some of, th of the um, victims that have been um, found mm -hmm. and chosen to seek services or, or have involved themselves in services. And so when you're an analyst in that way, you start to extrapolate numbers based on actual cases is one way to get those numbers. Now, will those, these numbers change? Undoubtedly, as we continue to evolve in this field, yes. Um, so um, we are doing the best we can. I think there's a lot we don't know. Um, there might be actually hyperbole in the numbers themselves, and that has been called to question. I think that's a legitimate question to ask at this point in the trafficking um, world um, or the anti-trafficking world. Uh, you might not know that there's a national hotline. One of the efforts that got set up was a national hotline in the U.S. Um, to meet the needs of people who are asking questions about trafficking. Um, I'll give you that number at the end of the presentation. They've seen an increase, a tremendous increase over the last five years, calls to the hotline, um, and 259%. Um, now, again, these numbers need some scrutiny, but I'm gonna give you some numbers about who's calling into the hotline. Um, most were about cases about women, most were cases about, or a third were cases about children. Um, and the sex traffic, in what they considered sex trafficking cases, 40% were about US citizens, a little over. Um, and they were about pimp controlled prostitution. So again, not um, prostitution that was uh, um, agency based, um, commercial front bro uh, brothels and escort services. On the labor side, uh, domestic work, restaurants, and then peddling rings. Um, we've seen uh, upsurge of peddling rings or sales crews. And here's where you'll see the emergence of men. We see fewer men um, emerge as survivors of victims in the sex trafficking industry, but um, you see them in labor um, more emerge or identified. I'm gonna skip over some. Um, are already talked about what were the policy, the international policy responses. Um, here is the um, U.S. policy response, which I think um, could use some good scrutiny from uh, the EU and from Europe. I'd like to see um, the EU and Europe do uh, their own analysis of how the world is doing and anti-trafficking, if, if indeed that is a, a good thing to do. Uh, but if you don't know, the trafficking in persons report that called the TIP um, ranks uh, countries in the world, 185 countries in the world, um, and um, true to how the United States um, operates, we did not rank ourselves for the first 10 years that we ranked other countries and finally started to do that in uh, 2010. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this. Polaris Project is the organization that answers that hotline. And they also do an assessment, so they take care of the assessment at the state level and how states are doing around trafficking. So, one of the things that we did was develop some typologies of traffickers. Um, and we primarily did this to assist around thinking through law enforcement. And these are the typologies. And this was based on a review of uh, tr um, cases that were prosecuted in the US. So again, um, it's a beginning place, not an end place for the data. Um, and then uh, in-depth interviews with um, experts in the field. And so we grouped them by the two ways in which at least the United States thinks about trafficking, labor, and sex trafficking, and came up with those typologies. And then we did within and between trafficking, so we de developed the typologies within the trafficking and looked at those def uh, de 
um, the development of those demographics and then between them. And I'm going to let you all look at those um, on your own. So um, one of the questions that might be compelling to this group um, around labor trafficking involved this case of um, for 20 years of uh, intellectually disabled men. Um, the issue of men was talked about, uh, men who were underpaid, um, underpaid because of their developmental disability. And so I think that it is actually being talked about um, in the anti-trafficking field. Um, I want to make two more points. So the other area that we've done quite a bit of work on, as I said, is we've interviewed um, victims over a series of six years, five or six years. Again, I want to state that um, I believe that people have agency. Uh, there's not one bit uh, of me that doesn't believe that the victims that we have interviewed um, should be able to talk about themselves the way they want to talk about themselves, engage or disengage in services as they want to, repatriate if they want to, um, walk back into a situation uh, where they're being controlled um, in the sex industry if that's what they want to do and they're a youth. Um, I do believe also I can hold at the same time that uh, people can be controlled um, and so I can stand in the same place at the same time. Um, I do not have to be on a polarized opposite. Um, I do not have to be on a polarized opposite that all services are bad, that all, all people who are giving services are bad and doing poorly. I've actually seen quite the contrary. Um, I've seen quite good debate about how you give good services. I've seen quite good debate about how you give services without involving law enforcement. In fact, I was involved in a labor trafficking case where a woman um, was labor trafficked and law enforcement wasn't involved. And there was a lot of debate among uh, the, she reached out uh, to the social workers and um, it was her decision not to report to law enforcement. And that's where that case has stood um, because uh, for a variety of reasons felt like she uh, she was in, it, it came down to too fearful um, of her trafficker to actually report because of the level of power that he held uh, in her home country and her fear that he would hurt uh, her family so those debate my, my experience is much different um, than um, the previous um, speaker in that there is quite a bit of discernment going on about how to provide services, the spectrum of services, um, and that we should stand in that very, very difficult debate about what that looks like. Okay. So sorry that was so quick, but I know we're gonna get somebody else on Skype to add to this conversation. So next we have uh, Professor Janet Halley, uh, who is the Royal Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, who is uh, mainstreaming us. Hello. Um, and um, so I am going to Skype you. I know that she is, uh, you know, watching this because she's uh, streaming. But now I'm going to Skype you. Let's see. Janet? I'm trying to be there. Can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, we can hear you, and I am going to turn the laptop so you can see us. Where is it? Can you see me? Uh, I see you, but I don't see me. Well, no. Is no. your video on? Um, I didn't have a video option. Um, let's see. Uh, I just had a phone option, and it worked before. When Karen called me from her office, I do apologize to everybody about this. Um, shall I shall I just speak it? Or do you want to okay. try one more time? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. Do you see a video icon down at the bottom at the bar? A little camera? Yeah. Just click. Just ah, click. Click. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> How are Let's you see, doing? Am I visible now? Yes, yeah. yes, perfect. Good. Hi, uh, shall I just go ahead then? Yes, please go ahead and you have uh, half an hour, okay? Thank you. I will okay. take all that. Um, hopefully okay. we can have a conversation. I am so sorry, look, I'm not there and I want to thank Tom and Karen for inviting me and being so gracious about my um, difficulties. But I want to talk about um, the trafficking system. I've called my talk Anti-Trafficking for Vehicle. Um, Anti-trafficking has been part of the International Legal Order for 13 years now. Um, it's well on its way into the positive law of many national and state and provincial legal systems. Um, it's time to assess the system, not for its aspirational contours, which have been nothing short of redemptive, but for its realities. And I share the sense that from a left progressive sense, there's much to be worried about. And the trafficking is a primarily a criminal law regime. It's a new crime. Understood as the trafficking of women and children into prostitution, it had been banned in international law for many years, but the new anti-trafficking system not only redefined trafficking, um, but added multiple layers of actual enforcement, criminal enforcement prosecutions. The limits of criminal, of criminal law regime and actually preventing the wrongs it promises to punish are easy to see when we are dealing with garden variety prohibitions. We all, we all know the criminalization in addition to the vaunted benefits supposed of I don't want to put a um, scare quotes around that, uh, because it's sometimes questionable, of punishing and incapacitating the convicted and of deterring would-be wrongdoers from engaging in the subject conduct also produces a whole range of less wonderful outcomes. Criminal law inevitably punishes in innocent, it creates false positives. And if anyone cares about those innocents, their victimization through their, their punishment can have the paradoxical effect of legitimating the very conduct we were trying to prohibit. Criminal law enforcement comes with an inevitable tolerated residuum of abuse, false negatives, or wrongful conduct that escapes detection, prosecution, and or conviction. I will call this the TRA, the tolerated residuum of abuse, following Duncan Kennedy's uh, article, Sexy Dress. The TRA leaves a margin in which um, wrongful conduct can flourish. Whole illegal underworlds can be produced in the TRA. And where prohibition runs out, permission begins. Anything you don't include in your definition of the crime becomes legal. This zone of permission plus the TRA create a nearly illegal world in which a particular figure that I'm, it, it called Holmes's bad man. How many people in this group have read Holmes's Path of the Law and know what I'm about to talk about? Okay, so Holmes, Justice Holmes had an argument that um, to know what the law really is, we should see it as the bad man sees it. And that is to try to see it the way a person who wants to avoid, to get away with the most, the closest to wrongful conduct that you can get away with, but not get a sanction too expensive to make conduct not worth doing. Um, so the bad, the bad man is not morally bad. He's not. He's morally neutral. He's just trying.
trying to get away with as much as we can. Um, the bad man gauges the level of enforcement, the risk that he will be arrested, prosecuted, or convicted if he engages in conduct with students just within or only sometimes uh, within but or, or sometimes beyond the letter of the law. This takes close to the edge. Especially if people think the criminal enforcement regime is working, the wrongful or near wrongful conduct that escapes detection, prosecution, and, and conviction will appear legitimate. Just think about how the acquittal of George Zimmerman went down among advocates of standard ground laws. This is not a mistake in the criminal law system, but a predictable effect of it. Somehow, anti trafficking has escaped this realist critique. Are any of these problems emerging in the anti-trafficking regime? Surely anti-trafficking is doing some punishing and deterring, but are the benefits of the AT regime outweighing its costs? What are the costs? I don't think we know, and I think it's time to begin asking. Seriously taking the idea that the AT regime could have downsides requires us to see it in context. Here's the context that may be new to people who to thinking of AT as the human rights system. AT is part of a new, newly dense web of international criminal law. It is an important building block of the contemporary security system and of an internationally interwoven border control regime. At the UN level, it's housed not in the human rights system, but in the UN, the UN Office of Drugs and um, Policing. The international AT treaty, the Palermo Protocol I mentioned before, comes in a packet with Convention on Transnational Organized Crime and the Protocol on Human Smuggling. Together, they require states that sign them to build criminal enforcement infrastructure that is highly transparent from country to country and interoperable from state to state, and to target it at people who migrate and to those and those who. Within that, AT carves out a small space for a migrant worker, a migrant who is a victim. I will add it has expanded beyond the intended reach of the Palermo Protocol to reach what I call traffic peacekeeping still. But it's, uh, it started as an anti, as a border control system, and, and it has actually been built up as a border control system. I'm going to be talking about migrant labor, so I'm going to continue to talk, use the word migrant. A migrant who is a victim, if he undergoes coercion during her migration or labor, she's exempt from criminal punishment. Her primary remedy is repatriation, and states have the option of providing services in any place. The system of which AT is a crucial part gives immigration receiving state full control over immigration into their territories and obliges sending and transit states to build infrastructure to help with that. How many of the funds going to AT are to be fed into the construction of security and border control enforcement capabilities? and have nothing to do with victim rescue or victim protection. No one knows that the funds are devoted to demilitarization, securitization, and transnationalization of criminal law enforcement are huge. Moreover, for much of the resulting law enforcement infrastructure can be used for other purposes as well. What is this as a form of labor market regulation? Let's start from the would-be illegal migrant point of view. To him, our for migrant smuggling is a valuable service. Before the AT regime, as Laura alluded to, this would be a pretty mom and pop enterprise. Making it more criminal and making it more expensive to do required greater sophistication and scale, three more risk tolerant players into the business. All of these incentives increase rather than decrease the likelihood that migrant smuggling would be of trade. It also increased the cost of operating both the legal migration services, even as it increased the demand for them. Both the criminal and the legal versions require profits to justify operating in this dicey environment. We would expect this because what we do see, the rise of large criminal underground, large underground criminal enterprises that operate in the dark can become extremely coercive, and the rise of huge industry of labor migration brokers that works with the sending and receiving states of our border. The former is a paradox, the underground part is a paradox of the tolerated versus a term of abuse, targeting organized crime to make it more important for crime to organize, to produce the phenomenon of AT as well. 
called the latter the brokers that emerged, the bad men labor broker industry, and I'm getting that in the scare book. Um, it will break, uh, it will break the whole form of the things that you can do so, profit of doing will otherwise engage in ostentatious shows of illegality. Where prohibition runs out, the commission begins, the bad men broker industry is legitimate, and yet it is highly motivated to use coercion against migrants to charge illegally high fees. Uh, and uh, it all, all while uh, ostentatiously um, following the law. It skims along the edge between prohibition and permission. Meanwhile, uh, states have developed highly regulated works of programs that depend on and work hand in hand with the bad man labor broker industry. Of course, Bracero and guest worker programs have existed for a long time. My empirical hypothesis, which I believe I can prove eventually in working on it, is that in the wake of the transnational crime convention and the ATN smuggling protocol, um, labor importing countries expanded these programs and developed them through regulatory relations with sending countries and with the bad man broker industry. Together, states and employers in uh, in need of cheap labor, states in need of out outplacement of labor and remittances. A lot of countries in the developing, the developing world are using this system as a development policy. Um, and the bad men broker industry provide access to legal migration and legal work in a country not one's own. The sending country regulates the hiring process, the receiving country regulates the visa process and the employment relationship. And the bad man or in the employee the work context, and the bad man labor broker industry mediates between them. The resulting system resembles the 19th century indentured servitude in almost every respect, except that the employer is not bound at all, and for the bound party, that is the worker, deportation rather than criminal punishment is the sanction for breach. Here are the points of similarity. Contracts are long for months and years. Workers have no role in negotiating them. Contracts typically tie workers to work with a particular employer in the entire term of the contract. And workers are not paid their earnings until the services are rendered. The payment is often made in the airport while the workers claim and home is delivered. 19th century indenture was different in several ways from this, though. Contracts were longer, the venture was at least seven years. Now they are for the summer, for the agricultural season, and for two years. The master was just as bound as the servant back then and required a duty to maintain the servant out of his own resources. Now the employer can fire the worker, and the worker is responsible for his own cost of living. Uh, the workers uh, promise to pay a, a whole range of services in this industry for their training while they're still in the country of origin, for their migration to and fro, for their visas, for housing tools, and they promise to pay those out of the future industry in the work that they're promising to do on the visa and through that migration. Back then, in the 19th century, both the master and the servant could be punished criminally for non-performance. This is so key. They could be legally actually forced to perform the contract. Now only the worker face sanctions for non-performance, and the sanctions are not criminal. Mm, I'm gonna have a little water, I'll be right back. Excuse me. As I mentioned, the primary remedy against the non-performing worker now is deportation, and all debts with the worker incurred to participate in the, re in the program remain due. <coughs> but now the worker is repatriated is back in the developing world economy where those kinds of earnings are exist in a, 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 a monetary economy that is scaled completely differently. Okay, the biggest difference between 19th century indenture and the modern indenture is how they sit in the overall political economy of work. In America, at least, uh, workers for hire were the exception. Most workers were either indentured or enslaved. Workers for hire and those who hired them for over were subject to intense guilt and status regulation. As 
Mike was nice to help show that it's really a book by some free labor. The legitimacy of indentured and uh, indentured and slavery were tied together as slavery lost ground, indenture fell apart, courts began refusing specific enforcement, that is, forced performance of the and disgruntled servants began to be able to leave their employment, as we said, at will. And correspondingly, masters morphed into employers who could fire their workers at will. What replaced slavery indentured, uh, indenture and work for hire then was free labor. That is, in American law, contract labor in which, unless they agree otherwise, both the employer and the um, employee are entitled to quit for any reason at any time. We call it employment at will, and let's emphasize the word will. Free labor is the paradigm labor system of liberal individualism and of a market economy in which freedom of contract is the reigning norm. Meanwhile, the role of criminal enforcement underwent a complete reversal, whereas before it stood ready to force performance of the labor relation, now it is focused on ensuring freedom of contracts. Criminalization of force, fraud, and coercion in contracts is just as strong a mark of liberal market ideology as the idea that contracts are free, and indeed it makes perfect sense. A contract achieved by force, fraud, or coercion FFC, I'll call it, is by definition not free. Prohibiting it is the legal system's promise to maintain a free market. Okay, now back to the new indenture. Indenture contracts we have now, I'm gonna bring this down a little bit and see if I can get a better angle, um, sit in a political economy in which free labor is the only legitimate form of labor. And here's where the AT system comes in. It is the guarantee of the freedom of the new indentured labor system. It transnationalizes a specifically American labor law idea. Where labor is subject to force, fraud, or coercion, um, it is trafficking and it is a crime. And where it's not subject to force, fraud, or coercion, it's free. It's freely contracted and it's highly legitimate. The Palermo Protocol defines um, trafficking as harboring, receiving, et cetera, of a person by force, fraud, or coercion, is the American language, it's a longer series of words in the, in the international treaty, for the purpose of, of exploitation. If it's not force, fraud, or coercion, harboring and receipt for exploitation are therefore legitimate, and that's the prohibition permission toggle that the trafficking system uh, 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 creates. It's not against exploitation. It's against forced exploitation, and it legitimates non-forced exploitation. Should we admit that the new indenture is free labor? Well, is worker coerced? The worker who refuses to work is not in jail, but is repatriated. And I won't go into detail, but the Palermo Protocol actually uh, says that the, per, the, 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 the repatriation is preferably not involuntary. So at the same time, it, it defines force, fraud, and coercion as illegitimate parts of the labor relation. It, uh, it legitimates uh, involuntary repatriation. Um, the um, the um, so involuntary repatriations are completely contemplated. Uh, the, the quadrangular structure of the new indenture serves to break the analogy with 19th century indenture here also. Neither the employer nor the broker asks the receiving state's uh, government to deport. Legally, that's an agreement between the worker and the re receiving country in the form of a visa, which is now invalid, and between the receiving country and the sending country and this is the, these are the commitments of the, of the anti-trafficking treaty itself, which entitles the, the sending the receiving country to force the, to repatriate and requires the sending country to facilitate return. I won't go into debt bondage, but I, I, a lot of uh, liberals want to make um, this uh, system into debt bondage. I thought Laura's comments on that were really interesting. 
technically, uh, according to the definitions in the international law of debt bondage, these, these debts, which can be paid off, and which are themselves marked at rate because of the size of the industry, uh, don't uh, think, at least according to my uh, first guess, uh, aren't going to qualify as, as debt bondage. Um, 19th century, um, 19th century indenture was contractual in the sense that the servant and the master signed a contract, but the state often mandated workers and masters to enter into indentures. Selection of the particular indenture relation is option, optional on, on one or both sides, but it could be first. That's not true of the new indenture. Both employers and workers step forward and elect these arrangements. And here we come to one of the most interesting elements of the system, and kind of the, the place where Noel's talk and Laura's intersected over my terrain. Um, workers want to get into these indentures. They, they flock to them. If, they, if you increase the amount of training that it takes to get into them, they'll pay more money to do the training. Um, we tend to think that because it's indentured, it's, uh, it's in this rate, but as leftists, I think our 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 attitude uh, about extremely uh, 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 disadvantaged labor contracts um, that people desperately want has to be a very carefully thought out one. So formally, that's the point of the last few paragraphs of this uh, presentation. The new indenture is free labor. But what about de facto? Of course, this is a question that can only be answered on a case-by-case -case basis, but we can say that generally that the worker enters into these agreements at a precipitous disadvantage in bargaining power that is reflected in the formal terms. It is leveraged to prevent or remedy acts of coercion deception during the process of the indenture is about zero. Uh, employers broke and brokers repeat the employer with bad men. Uh, labor brokers uh, commit just about exactly the amount of first fraud or first they, they can get away with. Um, take passport confiscation. This is a violation of several international labor conventions and has been held to be a predicate act of trafficking in some US convictions. But employers do it anyway all the time. They point to local law making them responsible for their workers' compliance with the terms of their visas and claim that they need the leverage that they get from taking the workers' passports, but they get a lot more leverage over workers from that. The workers now can't circulate safely in civil society. They have um, no remedies against their employer abuse in this form short of approaching the police and accusing their employer of local labor violations and trafficking. Um, and whether the police will, uh, Dina Haynes is working in the United States, States suggests strongly that walking into the police station and saying that you're traffic uh, causes the police to decide that you are not traffic. Um, but let's say that the police do decide to investigate and the prosecutor charges, the most that the worker gets out of this is a temporary work visa Well. She assists in prosecution and services, which I thought Noel very helpfully showed could be uh, beneficial or problematic uh, in, in willing to do more work on that. All that the AT system guarantees, though, is paid repatriation, preferably voluntary. Let's suppose that the employer is then best case scenario for a criminal losses system, uh, prosecuted and convicted. The worker can now hope for restitution, but the conclusion of the criminal case takes years. Meanwhile, the worker goes back to an English labor market almost at precisely as disadvantaged as he was when he entered the indentured contract. The new indentured is designed then to meet the formal requirements of the AT regime while providing the context for remedy those abuses. It's the bad and skipping by combined with immense tolerated residual abuse. And here I come to a remarkable feature of AT, which is long puzzled me. States boasting their eight, about their AT systems promise the moon they're going to end modern day slavery, save the victims, free the workers, end impunity. They blame for huge and unsubstantiated numbers of trafficking victims worldwide in the US, 
regions and countries as the motive for crusading effort that make the celebrities who adorn it look good. But the actual prosecutions don't amount to a hill of beans. Here's where I would situate the large part of the AT propaganda that reads about prostitution. To be sure, the sex sector is the site of some coercive practices. Technically, that is uh, all the Palermo Protocol targets, it's worth pointing out. But the US has defined all prostitution as trafficking, not a severe form, therefore not covered by the table, or it's not mandated to the State Department to do something about. Um, but it is defined as sex, and the idea that prostitution is per se sexual exploitation and trafficking has lots of legs. Many states, provinces, countries, and regional systems define trafficking as prostitution. Quote. Many in the, the AT system are waking up to the severely distorted view and listed in these developments that sexual con commerce is always exploited while other sectors like agricultural work, factory jobs are defined problematic and she could get a pass. And I think Noel's presentation manifested kind of where the, the AT system is about that now. Um, sex is prostitution, is trafficking, or sexual exploitation, very problematic. Um, but we need also to look at what happens in this and what happens in other sectors. Um, many are even getting at the driving prostitution underground by making it criminal, they shrink the market that does not eliminate it, make working conditions worse, blah, blah, blah. Um, but promising to save the sex slaves to, oop, to end demand, mm -hmm. got it, I saw my guy, thank you. The end demand for prostitution to rescue women from sexual predators is even more heady than promising to save the workers and fisheries who never get paid. And again, compared to what AT propaganda promises, its actual remedial scope is usually minuscule. Um, the, uh, the, the ending of trafficking in prostitution in Israel, for instance, didn't end prostitution. It just returned it to uh, physically prostitutes um, and caused the, the Israel to bounce of the tip of board ranking. Call it the overpromising phenomenon. It drives labor-oriented leftists crazy. They see it as, a hip, as hypocritical and have two responses, call for more prostitutions and seek to expand the scope of forced fraud and coercion. Calling for more prosecutions is, I think, a real mistake. The realist critique of criminal enforcement with which I began suggests that this move just buys into a mystified view of the criminal system, uh, what a criminal law system with this TRA can do, to tolerate that this extreme of abuse can really do. Rather, overpromising service serves to legitimate the system, to build up its moral credentials, to make anti-trafficking enforcement flow with the haze of righteous virtues and to turn traffickers into demons so marginal. We need not look for them. We won't see them if we too look in legitimate labor markets. The state's brokers and employers who have the upper hand in the new indenture can only benefit by falling into the resulting blind spot. How about expanding the force fraud and coercion? Um, here is a classic left-right struggle in contract, uh, contract regimes. And, um, but I would note that it's a criminal law regime. And my friends in the um, sex work part of anti-trafficking seem to have developed a kind of double vision or split vision of increasing the scope of force fraud and coercion when it applies in fisheries, in agriculture, in factory work, and contracting it when it uh, is applied in sex work. And I think we have to get our act together and understand that if we expand it or contract it, what we're going to do is include a lot more work that people want in the trafficking regime, subject it to the kinds of um, uh, 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 very complex uh, enforcement consequences that I've been talking about. So in conclusion, I would just say, let's get real about anti-trafficking. Let's not let's resist the effort to make prostitution, saving the prostitutes, a legitimating uh, a device in it. Um, but let's get down into the, the into sector by sector work on where is really tough 
long-term indebted work. Um, actually beneficial for the people who perform it and uh, and could we change the terms which they enter those part those contracts okay, okay thank you well, thank you thank you so now we have uh, 20 minutes for uh, conversation it's uh, uh, really fascinating my my poor brain was spinning as I was listening to everyone really uh, contrasting perspectives and part of the uh, debates. Um, so, should we? So we are going to open the floor then for uh, to engage in a conversation, a dialogue. And we have 20 minutes. One at a time, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just had a question for for Laura because I, I was a bit confused, and I, I defer a lot to all of the speakers on the on the subject um, of of trafficking uh, because obviously you're so much more knowledgeable in this than I am. But I was a little confused when you said that the the trafficking protocol was. You, I think you described it as a as a disaster, and 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 I've just when I've glanced very quickly through it, um, my understanding or my quick reading uh, led me to the conclusion that it doesn't actually deal with the sort of migration that you were talking about, i.e. persons who, for a, a number of different reasons, who will um, ask for help and pay for different kinds of help for, for a journey or for, and they will might indebt themselves to buy a ticket, mm -hmm. but precisely for a number of, of, of rather specified, much more severe, uh, coercive, or, or even forceful or violent uh, okay. reason, uh, mm -hmm. of certain, uh, at a certain point in time, find themselves in a different country uh, uh, and being exploited uh, mm -hmm. for different purposes. So I didn't quite understand why you meant that it was a disaster for the kind of people that you were talking about. So if you could expand okay, a little bit. Okay, there are that. two, two <laughs> different protocols. And it's rarer and rarer to hear anyone talking about smuggling nowadays. So there's a generalization uh, that everything is trafficking. And since the trafficking protocol mentions sexual exploitation and uses the term women and girls, it is very widespread for people to say all women who are selling sex must have been trafficked, so that they're never allowed to be in the smuggling category. That's really all it is. It's that people have, it's slid into that. Hmm. Yeah. Trying to find the uh, unifying thread <coughs> in this. It, it seems to me that, that um, a common theme, a way to analyze the, the subject matter <coughs> drifts to economics and history uh, as much or more than sex. Um, we are living in a, a more divided country here economically, and uh, goodness knows the, the third world is, uh, is really much uh, poorer and anxious for any remunerative work. Um, if I remember <coughs> my history of the uh, Industrial Revolution where boys and girls left the farms and flocked to Chicago and Detroit. And the brothels sprung up and uh, people wanted to rescue the women from the brothels. Mm -hmm. And the women didn't want to be rescued because they could make more money in a week in a brothel than they could on the shop floor in a month. And not and be uh, treated um, with more respect than they would be by their fellow shop workers and uh, and employers, and so I, I guess my question is, um, uh, aren't we really talking about what uh, what Marx might call uh, wage slavery, that most of us have been subject to in this country for a long time, and these folks are just uh, kind of joining us. You know, look, may I? Yeah. Yes. Convenient. Yes. I have uh, something. 
add one piece of that I want to go back to the history piece but to add to that I think the coercion too needs to be talked about and to who's benefiting also um, because you can have be talking about the person who's e exploiting coercing coercing um, if the person is buying the sex or the exploiter if it is indeed a trafficker um, and so I think those are different levels that need to be unpacked a bit, uh, um, that need to be talked about um, it, in dialogue. Again, not taking agency away, but I think that you know when profits are made, um, if the if the vast majority of profit, if you are um, giving your profits away. Uh, to somebody else, um, and th this is what I know from working with. It's called capitalism, yes. right? But, yes, exactly. But, that's what we have. So that's what we have. So, <laughs> if I can just finish in talking with victims, when you sort of do the numbers with them about how much they're giving over to somebody who is pimping them, that they're not realizing sort of that level of coercion, right? for a lot of reasons. And so then I think when you have that full information, right, then you can engage differently in decisions. That's, that's all I'm offering is that people need to have that full information and not, not everybody involved in that work has that full information. And you know, I would just offer that it might be naive to think that people do. Um, have the full information about how much people in the sex industry are making who are at the very top echelons of the sex industry. No, no, you so. can't say that thing about the top echelons. I'm very clear that I know the Dalits in India and the black bar girls in the Caribbean. This is not about top echelons. What they all talk about, to get back to the original question, is 
whether the situation could be recognized so that they would be able to make better work contracts, not have to give more than 50% of the money made from the client to the brothel owner. It's about work, which doesn't have to be work that you love, but is amongst many crappy jobs that people have, this could be another one, where instead of looking at coercion in this special way, to look at them as jobs mm -hmm. that could mm -hmm. then have some regulation. Yeah, that, I think we're saying the same thing, though. Good, okay. But I was saying, but information, not having the information is a point of coercion. And when somebody makes a decision with all the information, the coercion is leveled. So it's not coercive, is what I was trying to say mm -hmm. and obviously didn't say eloquently. And so that's what I'm saying is people don't have all that information. And so the assumption that they do, I think, is a maybe... No, I've okay. never said. Most people who are taking off on migrations have a bit of information about something from someone. Some people have better than others, but it's, it's usually... But I would say that I've never had a job in my life where I could fully imagine what the job was going to be like before I got into it. There's a question. Right. Thank you. Neville? Um, oh. This is, this is a really interesting, interesting discussion. Um, and I have two questions. And, the, the, and I'm using first names. I'm sorry, I don't know you, but it's just I've remembered that. So, so the first one is for Laura. Like on your slide number seven, no, not Laura, sorry, no. On slide number seven, you make a two categories, sex, sex trafficking and labor trafficking. What's the intellectual rationale for separating those two? Uh, because also in your, the, the story you've just been telling, like a waiter in a restaurant doesn't know the profits that's being generated off his or her labor. So I mean, so, so why we may, why, what, what, what is exceptional about sex trafficking? Why is it different from other forms of labor trafficking? Yeah, it probably isn't. Okay. Yeah, it probably isn't. I mean, is it really, it, as defined, it's really about compelled service, if you remember that's what I said. By, by really by definition. And then we really do this grouping. We've done this maybe not so good grouping because of services, really. So, so, so why, so, so, I mean, so, so it's an institutional rationale. Yeah, the best. That I, has a whole lot of politics and history embedded in it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. As I, it, it comes from the fact that the first administration enforcing the TVPAA in the United States that Noel referred to focused exclusively on prostitution as sex trafficking. This is the Bush administration. And th this category really has to go. Um, it's, it, is, it continues to channel every possible thing that, that Laura is, so, so, uh, is worried about. And we really need to move to the, the sex work paradigm in which sex work is categorically similar to work in a fishery, work in a, in a, in a farm, work in a um, mm -hmm. domestic field. <laughs> and consent and the denial of consent. Um, when, when you talked about distinctions between exploitation that was forced and exploitation that was free, and I'm wondering, do you, like, what, what is the model of mind there? Do you need some kind of model of, of false consciousness or, I'm, I, in order to tell people that actually, even though they're consenting to it, they're still being exploited? And I mean, and how is that? I mean, I'm, I suppose I'm asking what's the difference between a Marxist vanguardism and liberal rescue industry on this? I'm sorry, do you repeat that last? I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay, well, the, the difference between a sort of Marxist vanguardist understanding of agency and a, a, a liberal rescue industry understanding of agency, when you tell people that. Uh, they're consenting to their own exploitation in the definition of, or the, in the distinction between 
forced or fraudulent or coerced exploitation and exploitation that's ostensibly free. Yeah, the, uh, I'm going to draw a big distinction between force and consent. Um, you can consent to uh, things that you are also forced to do. They're, 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 they're link terms, but it's semi autonomous. And it's a really, really great question to have a whole semester on in rape, in, um, in uh, the, the context of uh, extremely um, challenging labor systems like the one that I'm looking at. Um, I guess the, the simple thing that I would suggest is that what, what I'm trying to add with this paper is that it, it is a liberal idea to think if you criminalize and constrain consent, you, you set your workers free. And that they, and they, you're not, you, you shouldn't be asking any further questions about the content, uh, content of the labor bargain. Everything in a Marxist distributional analysis would ask about the content of the labor bargain. Um, so it, it, it's apples and oranges at a crude level, um, analytically. I hope I understood the question. Actually, if, if uh, I, as the organizer, can ask a uh, final question, uh, I'd like to do so. And th this concerns the wording of the Palermo Protocol. Uh, I've always been rather troubled by the vagueness of the part of it that refers, I, I mean, we keep talking about coercion, uh, fraud, or deception. <laughs> but what comes right after that? I find rather interesting. Uh, abuse of power or of position of vulnerability. Right. Now, who isn't in a position of vulnerability? What poor person cannot be said to be in a position of vulnerability? Uh, what person who is an illegal migrant cannot be said? to be in a position of vulnerability. So doesn't the protocol, in effect, uh, cover the people that Laura is so concerned about? Uh, those who quite voluntarily uh, choose to involve themselves uh, in this enterprise of going to a new place and doing some kind of uh, uh, work that may or may not even be legal according to the laws of that country. Uh, I, I'm very troubled by the vagueness of this particular part of the protocol and, and see a, a, a real um, gap for including just about anything there. Mm. Um, can, I, can I answer that? Uh, yes, and, and let me just make add one final thing. Uh, all of these questions about consent and coercion and you know what is truly voluntary or not are, of course, exactly the same debate that we were having this morning in regard to youth sexual rights, yeah. where, again, there is also a denial yeah. of subjective agency uh, that's very troubling. But yes, Laura, please. Well, I just think that people should know that the formation, the writing of those two protocols went on for a couple of years in repeated conflicts battles between two different models of human rights, two different models of feminism in Vienna over and over with every single one of those words being a major battlefield so that there are append appendices, both sides in the end. So it took them two years and they fought and bit and scratched to come up with those words which are all open to interpretation both sides of this uh, battle put out an annotated uh, version with foot end hundreds of footnotes talking about what they meant by coercion, but they were opposed to the word consent because none of those words in the end can ever really be defined 
for everybody. We're not all going to, but so it's the way it is because they could hardly agree at all. So I would say anybody interested in that, what I call, that's APOC. Well, that's the APOC <laughs> term of the Palermo Protocol. You might want to look at Ann Gallagher's um, very uh, uh, interesting uh, report on how APOC could be interpreted. It came out last year. It was a report to the TIF office. No, no, it wouldn't be to the UN. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Pardon me? It wasn't to the TIB, no. No, it was to UNODC. Yeah, yeah I, that, that language, or you, you'll know better than I, that language looks to me like it was put in there by um, the feminists you and I don't like who um, assume that male donation is a position, it puts women in a position of vulnerability. So we basically um, are going to make, make, make agreements to engage in commercial sex there. Okay, so that's how the system will interpret it. Thank you. So uh, thank you, 7.30. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay, so. Thank you, everyone. Fascinating conversation. Oh, thank you. Our two have been together, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're going to see each other next year in London. Yes, and, and I'm, <laughs> I will email you. Thank you. That's I enjoyed meeting you anyway. This was better, a lot better than nothing. Thanks. Bye. Hello. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm taking care and I'm signing off.